I've had some less than encouraging words to say when it comes to NAD supplements, at least when it comes to NMN supplementation. The reason comes down to the studies that I analyzed in previous work offering an overall perspective that it simply doesn't do much in relation to various health biomarkers, unless possibly you're a little older, say 50, 60 and beyond. That said though, I've also mentioned that NAD supplements have never really been postulated to improve clinical measures like cholesterol, blood sugar, insulin, and so on. So it almost seemed like a self-defeating prophecy to have so many human studies looking at NAD supplementation and yet so few look at metrics that are actually NAD specific. Well, fortunately, we have a trial that was recently published and was brought to my attention by a few physionic insiders. This trial might tell a different story because the researchers address the NAD supplementation issue from a different perspective, which I, admittedly, really like. So, what does this new human trial show? And does it change my perspective? Really quickly, if you aren't familiar with NAD, it's a common molecule found inside your cells and it's directly implicated in different cellular pathways like DNA repair, gene repair, as well as plays a crucial role in mitochondrial metabolism, among other pathways. Without it, you're dead. I really can't put it more simply than that. I'll get into some uh, more specifics on some of the mechanisms in a minute, but first, the study. The trial, which was partially industry funded, split one group of people into two groups, a placebo group, which is an inert uh, non-NAD intervention, and the NAD supplementation group, and had each group consume the respective interventions for one month. And then they underwent a washout phase, a period of time where they uh, essentially no longer consumed anything and returned to their normal lifestyle. And then they switch conditions. This kind of study is known as a crossover design. It's a great design that reduces the impact of genetics and even nutrition on the results because the same participants are exposed to both interventions. During both time periods, the participants had multiple measures taken to assess changes in NAD levels, intracellular NAD specific pathways, inflammatory measures, and even an aging measurement. Admittedly, this trial seems more in line with what preclinical studies look into, which is why I wanted to bring it up to you. Now, before we look at the data, allow me to explain the different hypothesis that the researchers put forward. You know how I said most studies using NAD supplements in humans up to now have been pretty lackluster? Well, sure, some of that and maybe a major reason is due to looking at the wrong metrics to assess NAD's impact. However, the researchers acknowledge there's been a limited effectiveness of NAD supplementation, and that may be because we've been going about supplementation incorrectly. They present this graphic, which goes over the NAD production and utilization pathway dominant in cells. Previous research has simply given participants NAD precursors like the aforementioned NMN and NR, which means that they were given molecules that are converted to NAD through these enzymatic reactions like this one here, NAMPT, along with another one, NMNAT. So the researchers thought to themselves, well, why not just give NAD directly? Because no one had ever thought of that brilliant plan before. I'm kidding. It's already been tried, but NAD is apparently really unstable. So researchers use more stable precursor molecules. Anyway, what the researchers point out is that the enzymes that convert precursor molecules to NAD are reduced in concentration in aging cells. In addition, enzymes that degrade NAD like CD38 and NNMT there increase in concentration with aging. So think about it. The pool is less readily replenished by the precursors because the enzymes aren't as readily available as well as degraded more readily due to more degradation enzymes. A double hit to the available NAD pool. 
So the solution would be to co-ingest the NAD supplement with active molecules that rebalance both sides of the equation. They show that illustrated here. Note the different molecules, like parsley extract, that blocks CD38, thereby reducing its concentration. Theoretically, that is, because this is just an idea at present. We'll see if the evidence, if it actually pans out in a minute. Personally, I like this thinking. It makes a good or reasonable sense. So, does the logic pan out? To the data! Here, we're looking at blood NAD levels. The vertical axis is the amount of blood NAD, and the horizontal line is the time elapsed. The black bars are the non-NAD supplemented placebo group, and the puke gold are the NAD supplemented group using this magic cocktail proposed. Clearly, NAD levels rise in the correct group but not in the placebo group. This is an important experiment to indicate if the NAD supplement is, well, even absorbed. It is. However, one drawback of this experiment is that many previous studies have shown increases in blood NAD, but still have shown no effect of NAD. Yes, I understand that ignores some of the context that I mentioned earlier, but I'm just saying. Anyway, tissue NAD would have been preferable but whatever. We don't actually care so long as the other metrics change. So, do they? Let us begin inside of your cells. I like this experiment because they're addressing the actual direct effect of NAD on NAD-centric pathways. First, they look at CERT1. CERT1 is a histone deacetylase, which means that it regulates genes in the nucleus of your cells. Specifically, your genes are encoded, written as DNA segments, and these DNA segments are coiled around proteins called histones. The orientation of these histones influences if these genes are read or suppressed. The grand histone conspiracy of suppression. At any rate, CERT1 takes a tag known as a, an acetylase off the histone, which changes if the DNA reading proteins can read the gene and produce the protein encoded. I'll wrap this up by saying that this matters because many of the genes that CERT1 controls are age-related genes, as well as autophagy genes. Okay, a bit of background out of the way, and be aware that there's plenty more to be said on that topic. What did the NAD cocktail do? Well, I could show you this, but I doubt it would actually offer much unless uh, you know molecular biology. Yes, it's really ugly, by the way, for those in the know. Anyway, let's focus on the average results in bar graph form. We're comparing against the BL there in both conditions. That's a baseline before supplementation of placebo or NAD cocktail. The grayscale bar is all the placebo results over 28 days, and the vomit gold graph is the NAD cocktail. The higher the bar, the more CERT1 protein is present. Clearly, the placebo groups didn't change appreciably, and yet the NAD cocktail did increase CERT1, at least in certain conditions, and the others are all awfully close to statistically significant, which is set to 0.05. Don't uh, mind those error bars. We're, we'll be uh, returning to this later in how to interpret this. But currently, it seems that the cocktail worked at increasing CERT1 levels. By the way, the same was true for one of the NAD-producing enzymes, NAMPT. However, no changes in a potent mitochondrial gene, nor the aforementioned CD38, which, uh, remember, degrades NAD, which means that we're only potentially addressing one part of the pathway, the production, but not the degradation. All right, so I planned on covering some of the uh, inflammatory effects, including some more specifics on supplement cocktail itself, and I'll address some of it still, but I'll likely leave some of the finer details for the extended version of this video, which can actually be accessed if you're a physionic insider. The link is in the description. But fear not, we still have more to cover. The video's just getting longer than expected, and YouTube is uh, really not stellar for uh, getting into all the nitty-gritty. Anyway, 
check out the insiders if you're so inclined. And if not, let's continue with the aging effects. For the aging measurements, they used an experiment based on serum glycosylation of IgG antibodies. What was all that gobbledygook? They measured the amount of sugar molecules, glucose molecules, found attached to a very common antibody in your body called IgG. The greater glycosylation, the worse one's health outcomes generally, although it also depends on the molecule attached, but we won't get into that. Here's the data. That dotted line is the baseline, so before supplementation, and the black dot in line called the confidence interval is the placebo group, and the RETCH gold is the NAD cocktail. If it goes down, that's a good sign. It means reversal of age. Unfortunately, you don't see any statistical symbols indicating comparisons. And if you read the paper, there's no indication if this difference is statistically significant. So while it seems like there's a difference, we have no unbiased confirmation. Okay. That was a lot of information, so let me bore you with my stance, taking all of this into consideration. If we look at their intriguing and well thought out hypothesis, it doesn't seem that they provided very convincing evidence across the board. Sure, some enzymes were changed, but considering that they used uh, the wrong statistical tests, they used a student t-test where they should have used an ANOVA and the results were just barely significant, I'm inclined to dismiss this data. You may feel differently, but I just don't like it for the statistical reasons. In addition, if you look at some of the supplemental data, if you compare the placebo against the NAD condition, <laughs> the results really don't look so hot for the NAD condition, which might be why they separated the data and only compared against baseline within each condition and didn't compare between conditions. Then, in regard to the uh, biological age changes, I'm not sure if there's even an effect because of the lack of clarity on the statistics. Uh, one positive is that they do seem to show a small benefit in reducing overall protein glycation, and they did apply the right statistics this time. So that data seems accurate, even if the NAD supplement colors used throughout the study are, well, mustard hurl. I'll have more to say on the inflammation effects in the extended version, but up to now, I'll say this. I really like the idea, and there may be still some merit behind it. I just think that the approach needs to be tweaked. However, this study leaves my stance unmoved in relation to NAD boosting. It likely just isn't worth your money, except in the exceptions that I mentioned in my full investigation on the matter found right here. <laughs>